You're listening to Psych with Mike. For more episodes or to connect with the show with comments, ideas, or to be a guest, go to www.psychwithmike.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Psych with Mike or like the Facebook page at Psych with Mike. Now, here's Psych with Mike. Welcome into the bookless Psych with Mike library. Uh, you got to do something about that. I know. And, and we're going to the library. Where, well, by the oh, next I time. I don't know bars that are called libraries. I that's don't true. Know why? Uh, because uh, they're places of learned knowledge. <laughs> yeah, I've heard people expound in a few of them. Uh huh. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, there I mean, you, go. you can. I maybe even have done that myself. You can learn something in yeah. a bar. Have a reading if you try. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but by the next time that you are here, things will be More happening. Classic. Will yeah. be happening. Right. And and so, uh, super excited about that. Because I'm, I'm running out of my opportunity to blame the state of Missouri and their right for sanitized library it's a work in progress it's a work in progress and having our own uh space that is separate from my house i think you will agree is better oh absolutely yeah and hopefully uh we get back into now that the pandemic is over having people drop by i I just get distracted by all the toys that are in your house yeah yeah no. Everything known to man. It, you know, like here is a more bare. It's very Spartan. Pure oil, yeah. But that hopefully that will be different. I mean, I'm, hopefully uh, some of the stuff will come here. Uh, at least the books yeah. come here so that it can be a library again. In case you need a ready reference manual. Yeah. All right. People love it when they see you surrounded by books. They they think that they you're smart. Yeah. yeah. There you go. I mean, have you yeah. read any of those books? Well, that's one of my favorite things about watching the news on television. All mm-hmm. these reporters are sitting in front of our guests or exactly. Front, and I'm trying to read their book titles. Right. You know? And 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 not only that. Very but often it's like more about me, more about me. Yeah. Here's one of mine. More about me. I wrote this one. And they've got uh, uh, those world maps that always look like that there's something happening on them, and you yeah. you think, oh, Push these pins. people are these people are plugged in, man. Right. They they know what's going Rest, on. Favorite restaurants I've been to. Right. Yeah. So uh, you, me, you sent me an article, um, which I was surprised by <laughs> because I knew you would enjoy that. My, my brother, who is an organic chemist, uh, a PhD sent me an article about ketamine yeah. research right. and updates on ketamine usage as a treatment protocol for depression uh, and anxiety and some other things. And it was deep, deep, right. deep in the weeds of organic chemistry. Yes, it way, was. Way it beyond was, my capacity it was to very understand. Deep. Yeah. So then you sent me a more shallow Washington Post article about ketamine use. Uh, and now we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that it's probably, and we've talked about this a couple of times already, we've talked about it more generically with psychedelics. We've talked a little bit about psilocybin. This will be specifically focused on ketamine, although we may talk about other psychedelics as well. But I think that we have to be paying attention to this because this is the next big thing. This is going to be something that is going to hopefully revolutionize the entire field, but it's certainly going to be something that we're going to see become more mainstream. Well, yeah, I think what we are seeing, at least the information that I've had exposure to, is that for severe chronic clinical depression, that treatment resistant, medical resistant, uh, ketamine seems to offer some breakthrough opportunities for relief that appear to last over time, yeah. over longer periods of duration than the current standard uh, antidepressant treatments. And so then there's discussion uh, among clinicians, how do you do a ketamine treatment? Where do you do a ketamine treatment? What does that need to look like? How do you do it and make the client or patient stay safe? And how do you determine what your clinical objectives are if you're using it? Uh, or is it just something that we throw at the wall and hope that it sticks? Right. So, uh, for full disclosure, yeah. um, I have done a significant amount of psychedelics. I don't know if you've ever done psychedelics at all. No. Okay. So, just just for full disclosure, as people are, are listening to this, um, 
and I've never done ketamine specifically, but I have done a lot of other psychedelics. And uh, so I can see from my own experience where I, th this is coming from, and I think there is some validity to it. So let's go back to the start of the revolution. Michael Pollan's book, which is a fantastic book and is now an H uh, uh, Netflix series. Have you have you watched his his stuff? No. Okay, so he wrote a book, How to Change Your Mind, and basically he's a very well known author. I think he's in his 70s, maybe in his 80s, uh, and he picked up this mantle of psychedelics and went back and told the story predating Timothy Leary. So for those who don't know, maybe have heard Timothy Leary's name, Timothy Leary was a Harvard professor who, with a friend of his, got into psychedelic research in the early 60s but rather than conduct that in a clinically sound way, he and his uh, partner became kind of gurus and got lost in the cult of personality. This got picked up by the Lyndon Johnson administration. And so at that point in time, all research on psychedelics were quashed. We got the early 1970s, the schedule of drugs, which we know today as the, the law that dictates whether a, a drug has efficacy for medical purposes or not. And psychedelics were put on schedule one, meaning they had no medical purpose. Uh, they had no... Sounds like something out of a movie called Reefer Madness. Yeah. So, and Reefer Madness was one, I mean, that, and, and, and he talks about that, where Paul Azingler yeah. became the first drug czar and used propaganda primarily as a way to try and control immigrant populations. So they tried to control the uh, immigrant populations of Chinese after the construction of the Intercontinental Railroad uh, by outlawing opium dens in... Uh, San Francisco and California, because that's where the railroad stopped. And then they tried to control Mexican immigration through the control of marijuana. And this is another step along that journey of trying to control people through their use of certain drugs. So you vilify the drug right. and therefore vilify anybody who has association with the drug. My friends, we got trouble right here in River City. Yeah. And capital T and that rhymes with P and that stands for pool. So before Timothy Leary, all research that was being conducted on psychotropic molecules, on molecules that help to treat mental disorders, was being done on psychedelics. Yeah. After with, Timothy with Leary scientific acceptance and rigidity. Exactly. Uh, but in the sixties, when the Johnson administration was exploding the war in Vietnam. They wanted to have a way to say that our youth were being suborned and subsumed into a cult of personality and a cult of, of self-aggrandizement mm -hmm. uh, and distraction with drugs rather than being good patriotic Americans and going off halfway around the world fighting a war that they didn't choose. Right. Uh, there had to be something wrong with that. And it had to be because of the drugs. So let's ban the drugs. Right. And, and so... People were getting shipped over to Southeast Asia. Where they were getting drugs every and, day. And exactly. And they were doing nothing. right. Yeah. They were doing heroin and opium. And so the Lyndon Johnson administration wasn't as worried about the heroin as they were about the psychedelics because, because the psychedelics the CIA was funding a lot of it by the transportation sale of those drugs. Right. Right. But 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 because the, the golden triangle. The, the, but the psychedelics were being used by the population at home and leading to the anti-war movement. So Timothy Leary, his whole philosophy of tune in, what is it? Tune in. Tune in, do something and drop out. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I, turn on. Tune turn in, turn on, on yeah, and drop out. Exactly. Yeah. And that was leading to a lot of anti-war protests. So they were trying to control the use and distribution of the psychedelics at home because they wanted Limit to quash. The protests, right. They wanted to quash the protests. And so they, in so doing, they made it illegal for people to do research on psychedelics. And this was a time before the internets. So once you made it impossible for people to do this research, you also then could very easily quash any existing 
you know, notation of anything that had already been done. And so they did a great job of wiping it out. just wiping it out. It was gone. Until, uh, and, and so there were two institutions at that time that were allowed to continue this research. And so it was Johns Hopkins on the East Coast and Stanford on the West Coast. So Baltimore and Palo Alto? Well, I guess if those are the cities. Um, but... Uh, and these these companies or these institutions continued some very low grade, very under the radar kind of research in the psych department, right? Yeah. That eventually led to the discovery of what's called S-ketamine, which is the first nasal treatment for depression that is associated with a psych. So it's, it's a nasal spray. Yes. So S-ketamine, um, and uh, they had the, the the brand name. Did you do you have that in this article? They had the brand name. Yeah. Oh, no. la, 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 la. This is not good radio. Uh, exactly. Spravato, S P R A V A T O, is the nasal treatment that they that it has been approved by the FDA. So ketamine is the first. Uh, uh, psychedelic molecule that is actually approved by the FDA. So there are a lot of other people out there who are doing research on MDMA and on uh, LSD and psilocybin. That research hasn't yet received FDA approval. So one of the issues, though, but with a concern about yeah. FDA approval and, and drugs is that doctors are legally authorized to make off-label prescriptions. Correct. So the FDA identifies a drug and they said, this is a drug that's a specific treatment for these conditions and issues. And so if your patient has these conditions and issues and you're a licensed physician who's licensed to do level one drug prescriptions, this is what you would use it for and be full faith and grounding. Right. But as a physician with your training and experience and uniqueness of your population that you have access to to treat, you can use your professional judgment and use this prescription off-label. So if it's a specific for back pain, but you want to use it for the treatment of depression, which sometimes is an outgrowth of back pain, Mm -hmm. then you can try it and you're legally covered. So most of the research or most of the growth in the usage is an off-label usage where practitioners are starting to say, you know, I'm really getting some good results with treating these people that have this chronic depression that are suicidal. They're not suicidal anymore or they're for six months after or nine months after. So maybe this is an answer. And so then they go to conferences and they communicate with each other. And one of them says, oh, I tried this. And another one says, oh, I tried this. And they, they give displays up on the podium with hundreds of doctors in the auditorium. And they, they show their slides and they give their research and they say, you know, you might want to try this. Right. And, and it's legal. It, it is completely legal. Yeah. And, and doctors use, I'm glad you brought up the, the idea of off-label, because doctors use drugs off-label all the time. Well, they also uh, get in trouble for doing that, but the, but the argument in their defense is, we're licensed medical right. practitioners, we have the right to do this. Right, which is why I think that ketamine was the first psychedelic that was actually approved for treatment because ketamine is an anesthetic that has already been in the pharmacopoeia. So it's already an FDA approved drug. So psilocybin and MDMA and LSD have not been approved, but But they may end up... The ketamine was used to treat pets. Yeah, for so anxiety. For no, it's an anesthetic. So it, it it's used to put pets. It, its primary use was in veterinary clinics to uh, anesthetize uh, animals, to put them to sleep, to to go for and surgery and or to surgery. Kill. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I guess they. I don't know if they used it for uh, euthanasia or not, but but it's also a human anesthetic. I mean, right. you, you can get it in a hospital. Right. And so that's why I think that it was the first psychedelic that so was approved one of the, it, because they could say into, it's a, we can use it off-label right. to treat right. depression. So as it leaks out in a broader use, what you find is it's not done in a surgical operating room with a room full of people standing around to monitor everything. And so there's a assumed to be a right. greater level of risk for the provider and the recipient. So mm-hmm. doctors are experimenting with what seems to work best for our clinical population, mm-hmm. which is what you would hope that they would do. Mm-hmm. Uh, the question 
a question then that arises is the question of informed consent. Mm -hmm. So if I am suffering from severe suicidal clinical depression and I get to your office as a physician and you say to me, I think you might benefit from this treatment, uh, how qualified am I to understand your explanation mm -hmm. in terms of giving you informed consent? I might in my despair say, well, I'm suicidal anyway, mm -hmm. so let's try right. it. If it right. kills me, right. Who cares? then my family right. can sue you. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, if it makes me better, well, great. And if it doesn't make me better, I haven't lost anything. Right. Is that informed consent? Well, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, yeah. my, my the, the physician might... But, but can you have say it is. informed consent? Well, that, that was just gonna, that's what I was going to say. Uneducated population. Or, I'm not educated in biochemistry. If a doctor tries to explain to me these are the ways in your body that this drug works, and, and these little boogers go chasing after these little boogers, and they consume them, and they clear, I'm not going to understand that. I'm ignorant. That but way. is it informed consent to watch a commercial on television? I mean, the pharmaceutical oh, no, agent. No, right. I mean, I made my argument about. Once they go ask your doctor medicine. Yeah, right. go ask your doctor. Maybe you need this. Exactly. You know, maybe it'll make you better. And that's look, not look informed consent. Look at all these consent. pretty people having a, a party and, and singing and dancing. Their feet aren't even on the floor. They're doing feeling so good. Right. Uh, so, however, if you do take it, be aware it could cause your liver to quit working. You could die of a heart attack. You could. It, it's just like be suicidally depressed. But they say it really fast, really mm -hmm. slow. It could kill you. But right. the pictures are beautiful. The, the yeah. music is uplifting. So the only non-off-label, that's not good English, so the only uh, authorized application -label. of yeah. ketamine right. would be S-ketamine that you receive through a nasal spray. So you go to a doctor's office, you get a nasal spray of ketamine, you have to stay in the physician's office two for hours. two hours yeah. after the treatment. Make sure you don't have a heart attack or right. jump out the window. And then you're not supposed to drive, use heavy machinery, or do anything strenuous for the rest of that day after yeah. you're released. So that is on label. That is approved by the FDA. Now they do have ketamine infusions. That would be an off-label application. So I have a good friend who, uh, who I just took to the hospital to get a pick line put in their arm and their heart. Mm -hmm so that they can get infusion drugs into right. their system. Yes. And the infusion drugs are going to be delivered to their house. They're going to be taught how to put them mm -hmm. into the system. Uh, in order to install the PICC line, she had to go to the hospital and have it installed, and they used some level of anti-anxiety, mm -hmm. pain suppressant, distraction medicine. I don't know if it was ketamine. I didn't ask. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wonder, now that we're having this conversation, what they shoot her up with to make it tolerable for her to sit there while right. that was done. It could have been ketamine. It could have been phenobarbital. I mean, you the, the hospital would have to disclose that. Yes, it has yes. to be on her And And even if they bill. disclose it, I'm right. not sure that I would understand it. Again, coming back to the fact that I'm abysmally ignorant in that domain of information. But it, it could absolutely have been ketamine. But she would have signed an informed yes. consent to say, oh, you can do this. And they don't usually tell you what the drug is. They say, we're going to give you an anesthetic. And you say, okay, I'm going to sign off on the anesthetic. It's, I mean, I guess if you said, oh, what is it? They'd have to tell you. Yeah. But I, my guess is... Oh, no, they use short. I, I had a procedure recently where they had to put me partially asleep. Mm -hmm. a, a happy shot of some kind. And uh, the anesthesiologist came by and he says, we're going to give you something that's going to put you under. It's not going to put you out, but you're not going to remember anything. We're going to be able to talk to you. You're going to have the experience, but you won't remember it and you won't feel it. Yeah. And you'll feel really good. Mm -hmm. And he didn't say what it was. And I didn't ask. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, he said, oh, doctor. I, I want the ketamine. I did not. <laughs> I didn't know to say that. But then I wasn't clinically depressed right. at the time. Right. Okay. So uh, let's take our break. And when we come back, let's talk exactly about that. All right. Okay. Exactly about what? Hey, Brett, if you were going to tell somebody to check out something on the internet to help them with their mental health, what would you tell them? I'd tell them to listen to Psych with Mike. Why would you tell them that? Because it's probably one of the most easily listenable experiences you can have that will give you information that's useful for a whole spectrum of concerns that people have. I agree, and I have actually been told that by at least a dozen people, several of whom were not married to me, and some of them didn't even know me. 
That's amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> so when, when we get that kind of uh, feedback from people, it is so incredibly humbling and overwhelming for me. It is for both of us. Yeah. yeah. So we really appreciate it. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. Okay, we're back. So uh, one of the things that, and, 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 and I'm going to say that I'm concerned about it, that's probably too strong of a term, but I want people to understand you're not going to be, at least not yet, be able to walk into your psychiatrist's office and say, hey, give me some ketamine. So what the research is showing is that you have to be really depressed for this treatment to be... Which increases the likelihood that you're not going to walk into a doctor's office. Exactly. You're going to show up at a hospital. But... You're going to be sitting in a dark room somewhere. Your family will have to do something. But what what is no... This is actually no different than chemical antidepressants in general. So the Hamilton scale is the scale of how depressed somebody is. So they have Hamilton scales for anxiety, they have Hamilton scales for depression. They also have Beck inventories, which are very short questionnaires and are not clinically valid. Anybody who uses a Beck, I'm not telling you don't do it. I'm telling you that the research says those are not really clinically valid, but Hamilton scales are. And in the between 32 and 35 is the onset of suicidality on the Hamilton scales. Self-report scale? Yes. Yes, it's a self-report scale, but it's but it's like an MMPI, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. It's very well registered. Or, well, or, so the MMPI is normed yes. over in excess of 4 million people. Right. And have taken it. And the Hamiltons and so are you also. you take an MMPI. As a client, if you come to my office and I say, I want you to take this MMPI test, it's like 235 true-false questions. And then we send it off and they rank it uh, on their computers and they compare it to the bank of 4 million respondents. Right. And then the clinician gets back a report and it says, ask the person about question 25, Mm -hmm. which they answered true or false. Uh, 87% of the people that answer the question true have this going on in their lives. Mm-hmm. So ask them, is this something that's going on in your life? Otherwise, it may not ever come up right. in the conversations. Right. So you use the MMPI as an opportunity and an inventory to ask questions and get an understanding about the life experience of your client that you wouldn't otherwise get, right. which gives you a cleaner clinical picture of what they are dealing with. Right. And so the Hamilton scale is focused on the issue of depression mm-hmm. and will give you a similar kind of measure. If they answer question 37 through 39 this way, these are things that are likely to be going on in their lives that you need to ask questions mm-hmm. about. Do you have a loaded gun at home? Do you have access mm-hmm. to Do you have a, a specific plan for killing yourself? Do you have a time and a place? And have you written a letter? Have you told him? Have you given away any of your stuff mm-hmm. recently? Yeah. That's a big all, one. All the things that signify the immediacy of a risk for a suicidal action. Mm -hmm. Uh, This article in the Washington Post about ketamine says, uh, and I'm going to quote it for a minute, it's a quick paragraph. Numerous studies show that ketamine can work as fact-acting antidepressant, alleviating symptoms in many patients in a matter of hours or days. While no long-term data are available, and that's a significant statement, Mm -hmm. while no long-term data are available, In early small studies, small studies, ketamine therapy significantly and rapidly reduced depression symptoms in between 50 and 70 percent of the patients. Traditional antidepressants can take four to six weeks to take effect, and for some patients they don't work at all. Right. So you have somebody that you put on a traditional antidepressant, it takes six weeks for them to say, this is not helping worth a damn. Mm-hmm. Then you have to wait two weeks for it to get out of their system and start them on another potluck grab guess question. Right. Maybe this, if that, if this doesn't work for you, maybe this will work for you. Then you have another six to eight weeks while they continue to suffer their severe depressive symptoms and be limited in their responsiveness to life. And probably that single factor alone yeah. is why psychotropic or, or psychedelics are going to become the dominant form of you can anti- quicker. depression. Right. It either so helps you or it doesn't. In, in a, 70, 50 to 70% of the population so far in the small studies. Right. 
So Prozac, which is fluoxetine, which is a serotonin specific reuptake inhibitor, that's one of the primary right. antidepressants on the market today. You have to get into what's called a steady state. So you have to titrate. That means you have to take a little bit of the drug every day until the amount that you swallow yeah. is equal to the amount that you exterminate every day. Yeah. You excrete. And that's called a steady state. So that takes four to six weeks, and that is why it takes that period of time. So you have to build a metabolic level that's right. consistent. Right. Yeah. And with these psychedelics, you can take one dose and experience immediate alleviation of symptoms. I, so that's you know, my be, experience of you, Michael, is that when you get to talk about this stuff, you get a titration effect. Yeah. <laughs> I get fired up about it. Yeah. But. You get significant relief. You're not nearly as depressed as you were when we started. Well, that's maybe that's a distraction <laughs> thing, but I don't know. Uh, uh, but uh, what I think is important yeah. is for us to recognize that if you do a meta-analysis, so a meta-analysis is when you take a bunch of research studies and you correlate the results of a thousand research studies. When you do a meta-analysis, you do that on Facebook. You cannot also do that. Meta? You cannot. Okay. No, but although Mark Zuckerberg would like you to believe you can, but you cannot. Uh, but when you do a meta-analysis of traditional psychotropic medication, what you find is that people don't actually get a biological relief with the antidepressant until they hit those Hamilton scales of 32 to 35. So when people get really, really depressed, chemical antidepressants work great. When people are moderately depressed, they don't appear to be as effective, and any benefit that a person gets is probably a placebo. So if they're moderately depressed, why would you even give them an antidepressant? Well, because Except if you're a, a psychiatrist, effect. then that's all you do, and that's all you know. And so, you know, if, you, all the, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem's a nail. Aha, it's called the law of the hammer. Yeah. yeah. And, and so we give people, and, and to, to be completely honest, I don't care if people get alleviation from a placebo as long as, I mean, that, that's fine yeah, with alleviation me. is an alleviation. Yeah. yeah. But I think we need to understand that the, the same thing is true for these psychedelic molecules. People don't tend to get very, very specific biological relief until their depression is very extreme. If you have moderate depression and you go and take ketamine, you may feel better but that may not necessarily be uh, alleviating the problem of the depression. So back in the dark ages, when I was first learning to practice therapy, I was trained that if you have someone who comes in that's suffering from depression, and mm -hmm. you do your evaluation, you use your Beck scale or whatever you use to say, oh my gosh, this person is depressed, that you needed to understand that the depression could be caused by life events. Yeah, situational depression. Or it could be caused by biochemical change. Mm -hmm. But that you also needed to understand that significant enduring situational depression can cause biological mm -hmm. change. And so there are times when you should recommend your patient, if you're not a physician, go to a physician and be assessed and have the physician consider whether or not to complement the talk therapy that you're doing with a chemical agent mm -hmm. uh, and then continue to do your talk therapy to evaluate whether or not the combination of those two things was making a qualified improvement right. in the life of your client. Right. And I, I, so I think you're making the case for let's give people who have lower grade depressions the chemicals because they may be it's not going to hurt. It it's not going to hurt, and it might help. Yeah, right. And I'm and I'm totally fine with that. But I'm just under the supervision of somebody that knows what yes. they're doing, not just some jack leg person that says, "Well, you know, here, take some of these; they'll make you feel better." I just want people that listen to this show to understand that right now, you're probably not going to be able to walk into your psychiatrist's office and say, "I want some ketamine just because I want it." You're probably going to have to be able to demonstrate a, a pretty need. severe yeah. depression, which I think is reasonable. Which I think is reasonable yeah. right now. It right. may it may loosen up in the future, yeah. and I believe that it probably will. The, the other thing that I think is significant to the conversation we're having is the importance of developing as a clinician, if you can do it, developing a relationship with a couple of physicians that know you and trust you mm -hmm. to have common sense and to think in similar lines to the way that they think about treating certain kinds of conditions because there are times when it is 
more than appropriate is required for you to refer to a physician for a medical assessment right. to complement whatever your treatment protocol is, right. your understanding of what's going on. In my experience of 35 years of doing this, there were periods of time when it was hard to find a physician that would talk to me with any respect for what I had to say or what I had to do. Now, over time, I found some, mm -hmm. and those were very valued relationships because I could say to my mm -hmm. patient or my client, uh, call this doctor yeah. and tell them you're talking to me. Yeah. Have them get in touch with me, sign releases, whatever, so that we can coordinate a treatment protocol that's more likely to have a positive outcome for you, mm -hmm. which is our goal. Right. Why are you here? We want right. to make your life better. And I think that is a really good point. It's hugely important for clinicians who are doing primarily talk psychotherapy to have those relationships. And I, I like what you're saying because you're saying that you were controlling that. A lot of doctors have stables of psychotherapists that work in their office that work for them. Yeah. And what you're talking about well, is not, I'm not independent therapists. That at all. Yeah. I'm just saying if as a therapist you can uh, access and develop those relationships, you should. But I, I think that, that as, yes, as an independent therapist who is doing their own independent thing, I agree 100%. I'm not saying that it's wrong for a physician to, a psychiatrist to have a stable uh, of therapists. Right. But then they're doing what the psychiatrist is right. telling them to do. Orchestrating. Yeah. From their fount of superior knowledge. Exactly. Um, I think that it's p part of the message to budding young therapists or established therapists is don't fall prey to the ego syntonic thought mm -hmm. of your own brilliance. Mm -hmm. You don't know everything. Mm -hmm. And there are things that you can improve your treatment approach by accessing other information sources from other professionals. Right. So having a, uh, a community of interactive providers, I think is best over time. Right. And so ego syntonic is congruent with the underlying personality of the uh, person. Ego dystonic is when it's incongruent. And so, yeah, but I mean, you threw out the term. So I just want to make sure that, that people are. <laughs> I like words. Yeah. Uh, and I love when you explain them. And so uh, finally, I just want to wrap up by saying that the long-term benefit of the psychotropic molecules certainly is far superior. Like if you take Prozac, you have to continue to take Prozac every day to maintain that steady state. Yeah. If you take ketamine, you can get a long-term benefit we from We don't that. know yet. We don't know how long the benefit will last. They haven't done the studies over a large enough group of people to say, so, Here, here's what you can expect. So I will say from my own experience yeah. and from Michael Pollan's book, so when, when Pollan did the book, what he found is that, and he did a large sample of people who had done you know, uh, uh, psychedelic molecules, that that difference and, and the, when you talked about the CIA, their experiments on the MK Ultra, which was the CIA program using psychotropics to try and do mind control and other things. That long-term profound benefit appears to be about six, month in, six months in duration. So about six months after, so you do some... So the benefit evaporates or do you get worse? It probably evaporates. So like if you have, people talk about when they do these psychedelic molecules, the ego dissolution. So you're, you have a breakdown of the ego, which is your sense of separateness from the rest of the world. That you feel like you are a part of the larger universe. You see, you know, things in terms of love and connectedness. That kind of profound insight she tends to be pervasive for about six months and then starts to dissipate. And so these drugs may have a very, very profound long-term benefit, but it may not be forever. That's all I'm saying is that, you know, just because you go and do ketamine one time, you may have a really intense experience that makes you feel better. That may last for a period of time, but it will probably fade. One of the uh, questions, though, Mike, that gets asked, is how do you responsibly and ethically do yeah. human research? Mm -hmm. Because I remember years ago, years and years ago, when I taught sociology in high school, uh, there was a book that was really popular called Future Shock, and I can't remember if it was Alvin Toffler or Eric Toffler. I think it was Alvin. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the uh, 
videos that I used in the class showed excerpts from Future Shock. And one of the scenes was he showed this man that had two little uh, connectors mm -hmm. embedded in his brain mm -hmm. for uh, an extension cord, plug-in mm -hmm. a cord. Mm -hmm. And he showed him getting up in the morning, unable to rapidly function and come out of a sleep state and be able to work. And he plugged himself into an electric jolt. Yeah. And then he was singing and dancing and running through the house. So At home her, electroshock therapy. Taught, what, yeah. But the, the criticism of all that was you're doing unethical research on human beings mm -hmm. if you don't have all of these constraints. And you and I have both taught at universities where we have heavy constraints about any kind of experiment that might be done that involves people. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing an experiment on the manipulation of a group of people for something to say, hey, does this work? Uh, if, if you smile at people uh, when you first meet them, uh, for, for at least five seconds, big smile, and practice it and show it. Then you do this 500 times, can you measure whether or not you are? So uh, you, in order to do that and have it done in your class, to assign it to your class, mm -hmm. go out and conduct this experiment, you have to go through all these protocols right. and file paperwork with yeah. the university because they have a supervisory body that says, that's human research, you, you can't do it unless you do it under these constraints. Right, which is called an IRB, which is an internal review board. Yeah. And it's a group of ombudsmen that don't actually work for the university that grade. Right, whether or not there's damage yeah. to the person. And I, I think it's good that we do that. Well, like the uh, Stanley Milgram experiment, which is one of the most famous ones in psychology about obedience, uh, was done by misdirection. And mm -hmm. you, say you, you imply to symbolic means. I'm wearing a white lab coat that I'm a physician and that I ask you to do something that as a doctor you know doctors wouldn't ask you to do something harmful. Mm -hmm. I don't ever say I'm a doctor. Mm -hmm. I don't ever say I have the authority to do it mm -hmm. and when you balk because I keep turning up the pressure on you to do it and you say well I don't know if I'm comfortable doing that. I say well you have to do that. Mm -hmm. Then do you surrender to my mm -hmm. assumed authority? So Milgram was a very foundational and important study but it was highly unethical. Well, yeah. And at the time, they were trying to They were trying to research why, why the Nazis in yeah, had, had were listened to the right, to authority. Functioning in right. concentration camps when people from other cultures wouldn't be. Yeah. So uh, we're probably running long, so probably need to cut okay. it. But uh, this is something that we will probably talk about m m multiple times in the future. Maybe we'll even try and get somebody on who is who more connected to, <laughs> you know, this kind of, maybe even somebody who's doing this kind of therapy. But just as we're walking out the door, I just want to tell you, when I was in high school, I knew a kid that used to do his own at-home electroshock therapy. Yeah, I did. I, 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 and that's a story for another we, day. We could talk about the community in which <laughs> you were raised. Yes, yeah, we could. And their cultural standards, but we probably shouldn't. Probably shouldn't. Yeah, all right. So if you want to do us a favor, you can go on the interwebs and find us on the YouTubes at Psych with Mike and subscribe to the show. We would really, really appreciate that. You can find us on Apple Podcasts at Psych with Mike and leave us a rating and a review. That helps other people find the show, and that's very much appreciated. As always, the music that appears in Psych with Mike is written and performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue, and if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike.